Nice. So the central limit theorem, we mentioned it briefly a little bit last week from the standpoint of, of um, from the standpoint of if you take, you know, we got obviously a sample size gets bigger, our variance is gonna go down, okay? So what do I mean by that? Well, again, that in your, in your mind, when you picture this, go take a sample. If you're a high school boy, that means go sample two people. Who people? Well, the first people you run into, which happens to be the basketball team that just got out of practice. I want to know something about the average height of teenage boys. You come back and it's at 6'5", and you're like, well, who did you interview? Well, these two kids down by the by the gym. Oh, well, that's it, all two of them, huh? Yeah, which is fine. Hey, you know, whatever. Nice job. At least you did the assignment, right, high school boy? But no, it's terrible. So... <laughs> Obviously, sampling matters. So we talked, you know, we don't get to talk a ton about that in this class, but, you know, sampling matters. How did you go about getting that sample? Um, my boss sent out an email at, the, at St. Helens of the day where she expected you to fill this out, but there was no, this does not apply to me. So you had to pick one of these, you know, four or five categories. In other words, you're putting yourself in a category that doesn't apply to you. And then what she's going to do is take, hey, look at this, you know, 25% of them fall into this category. Well, only because you, anyway, I, I didn't answer the survey at all. My buddies, a couple of my buddies did. One of my buddies put ridiculous answers. <laughs> Whatever. I told my boss, the other boss, the one has a brain. I said, yeah, no, I'm not doing the survey. So, um, you know, whatever. But again, it matters how you ask questions. It matters who you're asking. It matters how big a sample you're taking, these sort of things. So you know, clearly we all know that the bigger the sample size, the better the results you're going to get. That seems to make sense, but but why? So the idea is this: is it uh, if you take a sample of anything, okay, it doesn't matter what it is, okay, you will find that you will get an average. Remember, this is the sample average. Now, someone might say, is that close to the the actual population average? Kinda, maybe, sort of. Uh, it depends, right? So it. This is the population. This is the unknown population average, mu. Again, only the good Lord knows this one. He's the only one that cares. I would just like to know about what is it. Okay, so I take a sample. Okay. Could be a situation where I know it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, the average diameter is supposed to be half an inch or something. I take a sample. Geez, it's quite a bit way off from a half an inch. So, you know, hey, the machine's broken. I know what it's supposed to be, but it's not that. Uh, it could be a situation I want to know the average age of Baskin and Robbins customers. Well, okay. I don't know what it is, so I take a sample. And, you know, I sample 10,000 people. And lo and behold, the average age is 21 and a half. I don't know, whatever it happens to be. Okay. What does that tell me? I, I don't know exactly, but it told me, I guess, what the average age was. Now, obviously, we'll be finding a standard deviation uh, from the from the sample. Now, again, this is the, the, these are both typically in our, in most cases, unknown, or we know what they are supposed to be. And when I say I know what they're supposed to be, what that really means is, is they're unknown to me. I don't know what they really are. I know what they're supposed to be. I don't know what they really are. This is the population, oops, population. Standard deviation. Cool. And so, of course, we're, as I say, we're going to take a sample. We're going to take a sample of size n. So, if I said n was a thousand, I mean, I sampled a thousand people, a thousand doodads, a thousand resistors, a thousand, a thousand, whatever it is I'm talking about. Okay. And so, what we're going to see is this. If I were to do this, let's say I take, I'm going to take several samples. I'm going to take going to take 100 samples. Right. Where did 100 come from? I just made it up. Okay, I'm going to take 100 samples of size n. Okay, now let's suppose, suppose we make a histogram
of those samples. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what they're going to all be. They're all going to be grouped around some situation like this. My histogram is going to look something like this. My histogram, <clears throat> it turns out, is normal. It is normally distributed. Okay. Now, we talked a little, I think, last time about normal. We're going to get into that a little bit more today because we kind of feel good about ourselves with it. It's not very hard. I'll kind of run through the process with you. But it's going to be normally distributed. But doesn't that depend on what the data was originally? And the answer is no. It has no, it doesn't matter what the data looked like originally. The data could very well have been skewed. It could have been skewed the other way. Or it could have been symmetric. We don't get, by George, it could even be, wait for it, discrete. That is, it doesn't have to even be a continuous distribution. No, in fact, it doesn't matter a hoot. The idea is this, if you take samples, and I just chose to do 100 currently, but I'm going to take samples of size n. And when I make a histogram of all of those sample averages, let me be careful and make sure I say that again, sample of the sample averages, they are distributed normally. Okay. That's kind of a big deal because a normal distribution is our friend. Okay. We can do a lot of cool things with the normal distribution. And so this is a big, big deal. Okay. Uh, wait, what if I did it with, uh, I don't know. Um, oh, 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 oh. Yes. So let's do something that's pass fail. Nice. These little resistors that I make, let's say, ooh, cool. And they are 5% defective. It's kind of piss poor quality control, but we're going to roll with it for a second. That means, and I'm going to see is there's going to be highly skewed that they, that I'm, when I take a sample of 25 or 30 of them or whatever, I'm going to have most of them are good. And only a few little pittances on the far end are going to be defective. Almost none of them are going to be defective. Okay. So when I think about that situation, um, that one clearly is skewed. And because it's binomial, it turns out that it is, um, it is discrete. And yet, when I take samples from that population, let's say I take a sample today, like four in the afternoon, five, six, seven, eight, nine, around the clock, for gosh sakes, it doesn't matter. I take samples of those, and then I graph those sample averages. What I'll end up with is a histogram that is normally distributed. That's a big deal. That is huge. Everything we do from tonight onward will revolve around that concept. That is a big, big deal. Okay. And while we're at it, check it out. It, there's actually more to it than that. It turns out it's a, the sample averages will be normally distributed with the mean or the average, if you will, equaling mu. That is, this thing will have the exact same average as the population. You're like, oh, cool. Like exactly, Jay? No, no, no. Okay. The idea is the sample averages are going to be distributed very tightly around this guy. Okay. Now, when I say I take a, I take a bunch of samples and by George, look at that, Jay. It's, it's, it's not exactly mu. You lied to me. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is we can then treat this as if they are, they, they are. We can actually do mathematics based on the fact that the mean or the average of these averages is the actual unknown mean. That's a big deal, okay? And check it out. And as n increases, that is the sample size increases, the standard deviation gets smaller. That is a big deal. Meaning that if I had taken, you know, however many samples then, uh, whatever size my sample is, if I take a bigger sample, I'm still going to get normal distribution, but everything is going to move in the bigger my sample size gets. Okay. And again, I think it's pretty clear if you sample two people, one's six five and one's five feet tall, you know, the average is whatever it is, five, five, nine, or whatever it is. Um, don't quote me on that. I, and I don't care. Uh, but the standard deviation is quite large, it's quite spread out. Okay. 
you take a sample of uh, 20 people. Okay, sure, you got a tall guy, you got a short guy, you get a bunch of average folk in the middle, and the average comes out a lot closer to 5'9 or 5'10 or whatever it's supposed to be. Okay, that's cool. But they're not as spread out, so the standard deviation is smaller. Let's say you get bigger, you take a thousand, really small. Okay, the same thing is happening here. Okay, the larger the sample size I get, the smaller my standard deviation is going to be. That's a big, big deal. Okay. This is going to allow us to be able to, when we're doing some testing coming up soon, to be able to, to be a little more confident in what we're doing based on the sample size that we took. In other words, you could take a sample size of five or six or whatever doodads. You could play the exact same mathematics that we have, but you wouldn't be as confident as your answer is if I would be in my answer if I took a sample size of, say, a thousand. Okay. And, and of course, there is a point of diminishing returns. Okay. We don't keep going crazy. I'm going to take an infinite size. Oh, good for you, pal. Um, uh, not possible, of course, but again, bigger is better to a point. At some point, I can't do it because literally, I'm this, you're slowing the system now. We need you to actually sell some of these doodads. You're welcome to help yourself to 40 or 50 every hour and check them, but I can't have you checking every freaking one. That's not okay. okay. I need to be able to sell product here. I will be doing quality control to make sure everything's hunky-dory, obviously, but uh, I can't have you doing them all. So whereas bigger is better up to a point, uh, there is a point of diminishing returns. So that's the kind of thing we're gonna be chatting about. Now, what I wanna do is demonstrate to you this phenomenon, okay? And so I didn't make it up. Someone way smarter than me come up with this long time ago. So I'm gonna jump over to my other computer because it's faster. And uh, oh, discretion is a better part of it. I can remember that quote. I had to look it up because that's why I turned around and come home. Because well, <laughs> didn't want to get stuck. So here's the game. I am going to start off with a nice, easy deal here. So I'm going to come over here somewhere, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to say, let's uh, let's simulate some data, shall we? Okay. So I'm going to just randomly generate some data. So I'm going to do random number generation. And the first one I'm going to do is I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 100. So I'm going to take 100 samples. There's going to be a thousand people in each sample. And I'm going to have them come from a normal distribution. So that is that they're, let's say, in the US. So height of 70 inches is the average, roughly two inches for the standard deviation. So there you go. Betsy's pissed off at me. I asked her to calculate it there. Ooh, look at them all. Look at them all. That's a lot. Nice. Look at all those. Whoa. So each column is a sample. Okay. Each column is a sample of size 1,000. Okay. So if I do this equals average. Average. Stop it. Average. Nice. Uh, A1 colon A1000. Oh, looky there. Yeah, but Jay, you knew what it was. Well, I did and I didn't, right? So I did it because I simulated this data. But what if I didn't know? I went to the sample of size of 1,000. And on this particular one, look at that. I got 69.8 inches right there. And looking over here. Look over here. I got uh, 69.9. Ooh. <laughs> Do I have any big ones? Something that comes to my mind as I scroll back across here, if you look at them, look at them, they're all right near 70. That is, the averages are not very variable. That's a big deal. That is the central limit theorem. Now, we're going to graph it in a second, so it's going to be even more cool than what I just said. But what I just said is pretty darn cool, I think. Uh, that is the idea that it's pretty clear that up here, you've got some shorties. Some tall people. You scroll around in there, I bet you find a guy that's 76 inches tall, but you'll find one in there somewhere. That would not be unheard of. If you take a sample size of a thousand people, there is no way on this planet that you're getting an average of a thousand people to be anything anywhere very far away from 70 inches, if that's what it truly is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to paste it, I think. No, you idiot. Just a minute. Paste special. Try again. There you go. 
And then I'm going to wait there, copy these guys. CW, no, it's not CW anymore because I moved it over one. C something, C, doesn't matter. You will not be doing, oh, it is CW, that's right. Uh, you won't be doing this part, so don't, don't freak out. This part is just to help you to really understand the self a bit. Uh, transpose, nice, check it out. So averages, oh, nice. So what I can, I can do is I can just highlight this column. There's 100 data points right there. And I'm just going to go ahead and insert a pivot table to, to make my uh, histogram with. I just think it's easier. And there's other ways of doing it, of course. But this is seemingly the easiest way. Again, this is just to help you visualize what's happening. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to group them. And if you notice, the smallest one is 69.8. The biggest one is 70.8. One, are you kidding me? That is ridiculous. Nice, look at that. Oh, that's hot. Nice. Now, what that guy can do, you see, put yourself in a little, uh, little histogram-ish action. Oh, nice. Uh, format data series. This may just look a little sexier for us. Nice. And like, Jay, that doesn't look perfectly symmetric. Yeah, no, watch this, check this out. I can actually group it differently. It's pretty darn symmetric, friends, is what it is. Okay, pretty darn symmetric, okay? So that's a big deal. That is what's happening. You're like, well, yeah, but that one was normally distributed. I know, you know, I know. What if it wasn't? I'm gonna do that in a minute. So just watch carefully though. But notice also that middle bar right there, the middle one, look at it. Look, well, who does he contain? He contains our sample average, our actual average. That's pretty sweet. Uh, you can do this until you're, until you're blue in the face. You can change up what you're going to group by. You know, whatever works for you. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, 0.06, yeah, whatever. And you can make it, you can end up with it making it look more or less symmetric based on that way you change your boxes with too. It's totally up to you in that regard. This is, again, it's just selling the point here to us. Now, something else I'd like to point out is what is the standard deviation of those guys? I wonder what the standard deviation is of these data points here. So I'm gonna do equals standard deviation of the sample, that's dot S of A2 colon A101. And look at that, you get 0 0.066, 0 0.066. How'd they get 0 0.066, Jay? Excellent question, sir. Here's how they did it. When I said earlier that the standard deviation gets smaller as n gets bigger, this is how it happens. Okay. This is how it happens. It turns out that I'm going back to my other computer for a second. It turns out that the that the actual standard deviation is the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. This is the standard deviation for our sample averages. Wait a minute. As n gets bigger, my denominator gets bigger, my whole standard deviation is going to get, of course, get smaller. So in our case, we're going to be dividing by the square root of 1,000. So we had 2 inches divided by the square root of 1,000. Let's see what that, oops, that's the counter, dummy. You don't have the counter, you'd like a calculator. Oh, go away. Let's try that again. Two divide by 1,000 squirt equals, hey, 0 0.06. Oh, ho, ho. what did we get a minute ago? We got 0 0.06 ish. Again, these will not be exact, but these will be the numbers that we used. Now, wait a minute. So, what you're saying, Jay, you're saying that instead of my my, my distribution being strung out so that it's two inches, oops, from 70 in the middle to over to 72 and over this way to 68, that's one standard deviation here and one standard deviation here. That's true. What I'm saying is, is it still based at 70? Oh yeah, it is. 
And now one standard deviation is going to be 70.06, dude, and 69.94. The same percentage of the population that's between here and here is between here and here. Wait a minute, I need to come up for air. That's 68% of the population in here. That's right. Wait, you're telling me 68% of the uh, of those sample averages will fall between here and here? Yes, exactly what I'm saying. So it wouldn't need to move very much. For instance, let's say you're watching the machine and there's been some issue. It wouldn't have to be very far out of whack before we could identify it. That's correct. That's correct. So if the machine had to be broken like like completely broken, like it's like you're filling milk bottles and like they're overfilling, like ridiculously over, or like you just squirt a quart into the jug and it's a gallon jug, like uh, that's a lot off, bro. If that milk jug came across and you filled it up and then the next one, the next one, the next one, and then I add, let's say I take a bunch of them off the shelf and off the assembly line and I test them and the son of a gun, it, you could be, you know, instead of, may say maybe there's a, I don't know, a very small variation, a very small standard deviation, obviously, I can't have milk leaving the factory. I can't have that much of slop, right? So, but let's just pretend for the sake of argument that it was two ounces with my standard deviation. If I take a sample size of a thousand, then 0 0.06 of, a, a, of an ounce would be my standard deviation. In other words, you'd almost be hard pressed to measure it, right? And so it wouldn't take much for you to say, whoa, shut the machines down. We're going to have to fix our problem right here. Now, that's a big deal. I, I can't understand. That is such a big deal. And again, here's the best part. It doesn't matter what the distribution is. It, regardless of the distribution of the axes. That is, I don't care how they could be normally distributed like the last one. They can be binomial like the one I'm going to do right now. They could be some kind of goofy skewed thing like I could do later on. What doesn't make any difference, nah. -uh. What matters is, is that when I take in a sample averages from the sample averages um, from samples of size N, are distributed normally with same mean as x, but standard deviation divided by square root of n. The way we say it is this, we say X bar is distributed normal, mu sigma over square root of N. That's how we write it. So the X bars are distributed normal, mu sigma over square root of N. Again, the fancy way of saying this is, is that the, that the sample averages are always normally distributed, that's fact. Same mean as the original population, but the standard deviation will be smaller as n gets bigger. That's in, that's just it's crystal clear. It's obvious. It's as obvious as anybody can think about. It. That's just how it always goes. Okay. So this next one, I'm going to start off with binomial. I'm going to do a binomial one. And so, oops, what are you doing, stupid? So this time I'm going to say x is distributed binomial. And you need to tell me, of course, you need to tell me N and P. So I'm going to always write like this. So in our case, I'm going to write X is distributed binomial. I'm going to do a same, I'm going to do 100 and 0.05. So this is X is the, our uh, res resistors, right? And it is defective resistors, I should say, defective resistors okay. 
So tell me this, how many would you expect to be defective? How many defective, defective do you expect out of 100? Well, I would expect five. So that's the expected value. It's also the mean, that's what it's supposed to be. So in a minute, when we do, when I do some simulation here in a minute, I'm going to take some sample. I'm going to take some samples. Okay, I'm going to go take some whatever. I haven't decided how big a sample I'm going to take yet. Well, that's not true. I'm going to take samples of size 100. Okay, uh, because that this n happens to come from right here. Okay, I'm going to take a sample of size 100. Uh, it's the same n as before because again, you need to tell me how many times you're playing. Remember, that's what the binomial says. It's win or lose. In this case, it's defective, not defective. I can't decide if I'm defective. You're defective, okay? Um, so I play 100 times. How many defectives would I expect to get? It's pretty clear that this guy is going to look, when you graph it, like this. Yeah, it's going to be skewed. That is, there's going to be a big hump down here low. Not, wouldn't be shocked at all. Matter of fact, it wouldn't even look like that. It's not true. It'd look like this. It'd be like that, and then down, and then tail off. But it's clearly going to be skewed because it's gonna be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. Those are the most common ones that are gonna show up. And then it'd be like, could you get 20 defective out of 100? Um, if you're expecting five, yeah, probably not. Can I get 47? No, absolutely not, can't happen. Well, in theory, okay, no, it still can't happen, okay? It's not gonna happen. Now, uh, this is one that I don't talk a lot about, so I'm just gonna tell you right now, for the binomial distribution, it's N, P and Q. That is how you find the standard deviation of, of, of that. I only mention it in this specific case because it's something I want to go do in a second here. Okay. So in our case, it's going to be this again, where you are corroborating um, the fact that I said it should be this. And we're going to go see if, if our little demonstration actually holds true or not. Uh, clear, 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 clear. Uh, if I don't calculate, it would move. It would be helpful. 100 times 0 0.05 times 0.95. That's not 0.95. 0.95. Huzzah. Squirt 2.18. Okay, that should be our standard deviation. Now, we're going to go take some samples. So I'm going to jump back to the other computer here. Because it's easier to do on the big one. Nice. And so I am going to come in here like this. And I'm going to put in. Uh, and I remember, this is a. This is a. Um, what I'm looking for. This is a. Uh, it's a number generator. So you can't put in win, lose or defective, not defective. So I'm just going to define my ones to be defective. I do it that way because that way and I can just add up the columns and see how many defectives there are in a column and make it run my life easier. But I can do it the other way for me. Yeah. So it's binomial 5% one and then the other. So 100, yes, that's 100 in each column. Uh, let's don't do 1,000. Let's do. Let's, well, let's let's do 500 just for fun. Sure. Uh, I want you to see that it doesn't make much difference in our case. We're doing binomial. Oh, I didn't even need these. I'm sorry. I was never mind. I'm stupid. I didn't need that. All right. Yes. Yeah, so here we go. There we go. Nice. Oh, let me back the train up here. Let me back the train up. Well, let me hit enter, and then you tell me what I did. Okay. So as you can see, what's happened here is Marcy, I mean the Betsy here, the computer, she actually rolled it a hundred times right here. Are you with me? She rolled it a hundred times right here. She rolled a hundred more, hundred more, hundred more, hundred more, a hundred times. Okay. A hundred, a hundred times. <laughs> there. Wait. How did I say? Oh, five hundred times. What just happened? 500 times, okay. 
So, okay, so be careful of that. So it's 500, and then we scrolled across to here, and this should be still 100. Okay, good, there we go. Oh, we got this. I got this now. Here we go. So pay attention on this one. So n, n equals 500 this time. Just be careful of that. n equals 500 because we did it 500 times, okay, in each sample, okay? So this is, you took out 100 resistors, two of them were defective. Here you did it again, you got 100 out, one was defective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so from that whole sample, that whole column A, I'm gonna do the average. Five. And look at them. There's no variation to speak of. Hey, I'm not shocked by this. I was paying attention in my life. So far, I've paid attention to myself. Bad paste special here just for fun. Paste, I said. Paste. Special. Copy. Copy. Transpose. We got this. Average. Cool. And so now... Again, there's a hundred of these guys, a hundred of them. Uh, I'm just going to make another histogram just so that hopefully we can see this going on. It makes sense to us. Once you get this, the, everything we do is going to be based on this. This is a big deal. It is a huge concept. Nice. And if I group these guys... So we're going from 4.6 to 5.2. Sure, count by 0.1s. Oh, nice. Look at that. Let's go a few more bars. Let's throw a few more bars at it. 0 0.07. Nice. Oh, even better. That is just all kinds of cool. Uh, insert. Boom, boom, done. Oh, look at that. But Jay, it was skewed. It certainly was skewed. Nice. And it certainly was discrete. And yet we can treat this as the normal distribution. Okay. Now, what happens again, as I do bigger samples, okay, that is in our case, we did 500 in each sample, right? And each column is 500. The bigger that is, the bigger that number gets, the 500, the bigger that number gets, the smaller my standard deviation is going to be. So as you can see, we're still fairly spread out from a 4.6 something to 5.2 something. Okay. Uh, I wrote it down over here. Let me just get it on my other piece of paper here. Uh, where did it go? Um, 2.18 was our standard deviation. Okay. So if I do this, equals 2.18. Divide by the square root of 500. I will see it's 0 0.097, 0 0.09798, whatever, okay? If I come back over to that data set that I just had here, equals the standard deviation of uh, A2 colon A101, 0 0.09, I can't remember what I said, 0 0.09, is that what I said? Right. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that hot? Nice. Now, again, everything we're going to be doing from now on throughout the rest of the book is going to hinge on that concept right there. Okay. Why does it matter to me? Okay. Well, because the less spread out something is, the 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 less you have to be different to stand out. Okay. You're walking down the street in Portland. I'm sorry for your loss, but okay, there you are. You're walking down the street in Portland. Okay, how how weird do you have to be to stand out in Portland? Well, I saw a guy with a cowboy hat riding a rubber duck thing, and he was bouncing up and down like he's like riding a like a little uh, stick horse thing with a rubber duck head. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's Tuesday afternoon in Portland. Okay. And I saw this other guy and like he was wearing a head to toe Oregon Ducks uh, romper thing and it showed his tummy button and his little, uh, he had a little, uh, he had a little uh, pierced belly button thing. And you're like, yep, it's Tuesday afternoon in Portland. Awesome. You would have to be like, I don't even know what you have to do dress wise to stand out in Portland. 
I, I don't even know. When I was a kid in Eastern Washington, out in the sticks, where there was like when you went gross, when you went clothes shopping for school, you drive to Walla Walla, you get out, you go into JC Penney's. You didn't have any clothes there. You walk across the street to Sears, then you walk across the street to the Bon Marche. And if your family went there, which my family didn't, you went to Kmart. Those are your choices. That's it. Hey, I have that same shirt. Of course you do. We all shop the same place. Hey, I have those same exact shoes. Of course you do. We all shop at the same place. So if you moved in from <gasps> Pasco or somewhere to our little town, whoa, you've got green Nikes on. Whoa, you stand out or whatever. Okay. It didn't take much to stand out from a crowd in Dayton where I grew up. It did not take much at all. I mean, you didn't have to try very hard to stand out there. Okay. Why? Because there was no variation between us. So just a little bit out, holy mackerel, that's weird. Okay. Versus Portland, the spread is like, it's almost infinite. So how far out would you have to be before you stood out? I, I don't know. Good luck finding that person. OK, it would be weird. That is the beauty of this thing. This that is what is so nice. Well, it's one of the things that's so nice about this. This allows us to be able to make statements a lot more clearly. And that's what's going to be awesome. So that's where we're going with this tonight. And so we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about, OK, well, what is that going to do for us? And, and where does that put us? OK, so. Some things that we're going to chat about here, and I think we mentioned last time. Uh, standard normals. We talked about Z scores, I believe. Let's just review those really quickly. Z score is how many standard deviations from the mean you are. So we talked about this a little bit, but let's go ahead and write that down again. A value is. Okay, we're always going to use Z scores. So if it's a single value, it's going to be this X minus the mean over the standard deviation, okay? So if the mean was 70 and the standard deviation was two again, then you at 68 inches are 68 minus 70 over two. You are one standard deviation below the mean. Uh, but how does that change? How does that change when I take a sample? So when you take a sample, with central limit theorem, boom, 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 what we've just been talking about, the z-score now becomes this. It's x bar minus the mean sigma over the square root of n. So look what's happened. This difference on top, I don't know what x bar is just yet, but this difference might very well be the same as it was before. Maybe it is negative two, I don't know yet. But here's the big deal. My, my standard deviation is a lot smaller now. What's that going to do to my z-score? It's going to blow it up. Blow it up. That's a big deal. Okay. So this is what we're going for. Okay. So we're going to come back over this over and over and over and over and over, over, over it again. But for instance, let's say you took a sample of, of um, 100 dudes. And you found that their average height was 68 inches. The average of all those 100 dudes is 68 inches. Jay, that doesn't seem very plausible. No, no, it really doesn't. Like how implausible is it? Well, I'll keep your shirt on. We're going to show that in just a few if you can be excited. So we're going to do 60. Oops. Yeah, and the mean is still 70, by the way. So minus 70. And then two over the square root of 100. This just seems a little implausible. Two over the square root of 100. Well, the square root of 100 is 10. So this is 0.2 down here. And so this becomes negative 10. You are 10 standard deviations below the mean. Check this out. Ain't gonna happen, okay? Not gonna happen, just straight up isn't gonna happen, okay? Um, so this is the beautiful thing, right? Because you made this denominator so small, it's gonna blow this guy up. In other words, in this, that last, that example there is ridiculous, 
Okay, but when it comes to collecting data and doing tests later on, we don't have to be very far out to the point where something's weird. So either either one of two things is going to happen. Either I witnessed a rare event, like something very rare, like, oh, you want the Powerball? Yeah, that's pretty rare. I'm sure it is. Or, oh, whoops, I made a mistake. Yeah, now that happens every day. Okay, so that is not weird. So this is what's all to be based on. You're going to see this is always about the probability aspect. Okay. Now, before we get going, so let's review this thing here. We mentioned this thing last week, a little bit of this. We talked about, again, let's just review really quickly. If you have your mean there, this is your mean plus one standard deviation, the mean plus two standard deviations, the mean plus three, and then, of course, going this way. Because once you see this, you can't unsee it. And the whole thing just makes so much more sense, okay? This is why I spend a lot of time talking through this because once you get it, yes, I just tell me the formula. Well, of course I can't. But once you start seeing it, you're like you're, all of a sudden it becomes so crystal clear. Problem, 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 whatever it is. You can pick them out a mile away. Okay. Because it just becomes obvious based on what you're doing. Okay. Within one standard deviation, we said there's approximately 68%. This is approximate. Okay. Within two. 95% approximately. Within three standard deviations of the mean, this is everybody. 99.7. Now, the way I like to think of this is this, at two standard deviations, there's a sign that says, welcome to freak bill. Meaning it is very little chance that I just saw what I just saw. Like it is very weird. It's very weird. Now, obviously, you can be freakishly tall, freakishly short, freakishly whatever. It doesn't really matter. I just use the term. This is weird. Statistical freak. Statistical anomaly, if you will. I don't care. You can call it an anomaly, Bill. It doesn't matter to me. Okay. Two standard deviations is where we pretty much draw the line. Okay, right around two standard deviations. It will depend on a couple of things we talk about later on, but right around two deviations. If you take a sample and, and, and you're going to find it a, an average from that sample, okay, if you're outside of two standard deviations, there's a problem. Okay, that's going to be a big deal. That should stand out like a sore thumb. Okay. Now, of course, three de what's three deviations? I would suppose, I guess, that I would call this downtown Freakville, I guess, right? Downtown Freakville. That doesn't change what you're thinking. That's just freakishly weird that you just saw that happen, okay? And then, of course, four, five, ten. Oh, are you kidding me? Ten standard deviations? What? Now, think about that. If you're three deviations taller than the average man in the U.S., that you're 76 inches tall, roughly. Okay? That's, that's, that's six, four. Well, that doesn't seem that tall. No, for one person, it doesn't seem that tall, but that's still pretty big. But what if you took an average of 100 dudes and the average came back 76 inches tall? I'm going to come back to you and go, uh, listen, pal, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I don't know where we are, dude, but uh, that's freaky. Okay, there, there's something weird here. Um, now, in, already, in most people's cases, you're like, oh, some idiot went and talked to basketball players. Gotcha. Okay. But it could be something else. It could have been like, uh, something's weird here, but uh, I think someone's changed. You know, it could have been now height, obviously, something that's hard to, to quantify. I mean, it's hard to, it's not going to change drastically like that. But let's say you're the principal at the school and you want to reduce the number of tardies. So you put in some new program. We're going to start punishing kids, give them detentions, whatever it happens to be. Obviously, if that program works, you should see more, or I'm sorry, less average detentions or less average targets, I should say, um, as time goes on. Okay. In other words, if it stayed the same, uh, your program sucks. <laughs> if there's more, your program sucks. The idea is it's supposed to reduce targets. That's the whole point. Okay. Remember, statistics, the whole point of statistics is to make a decision to improve stuff. That's the whole point. So we see there's a problem, kids are targeted class, it's annoying, it's, it's hard to teach around that, et cetera. Okay, so the deal is we're gonna start handing out detentions or whatever we're gonna do in an effort to reduce targets. So what do you do? Well, you take a sample, okay? You take a sample, you know, for the next three or four days or weeks or whatever it is, take a bunch of samples. And then son of a gun, it turns out that our sample average 
dude, it's like five standard deviations below the mean. That's weird. No, no, it's not weird. It's all, it would only be weird if you didn't do something different. You see, it's, it's not weird because in your mind, you go, Jesus, everything should be the same, but everything is not the same. You change the variable. Okay. And so what that means to me is, hey, it's weird, but it's only weird if nothing has changed. So guess what? We're going to assume that my program worked at that point. That is how every test that we will do from here on, starting next week, really, and going forward, will be set up that exact same way. Okay? You've noticed the problem. Okay? You work somewhere. You sit there on the assembly line. You, 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 whatever it is you do. Okay? And you go, son of a gun. I feel like things are different than they used to be. Things are more expensive, less expensive, fatter, taller, skinnier. Uh, not so much. We they weigh more. They weigh less. I, uh, I know there's more people coming in asking about this kind of a question. It seems like on the weekends, we're getting a lot more tech questions about blah, blah, blah at my computer company, whatever it happens to be. And you start testing it. You're like, oh, that's weird. And then you say, well, what am I going to do to fix that? Well, I'm going to implement this new program or whatever it happens to be. Or, And, and then you test to see if that works. Or... It seems like, you know, we're doing some quality control, and though the average is supposed to be this, man, it looks like it shifted drastically. Well, what should you do? Well, fix your machine because it's broken. Okay, that's what it's always going to be about. Okay, so it's kind of a big deal. Now, on Excel, the way this works is this. If I have a distribution, wee, uh, and let's say I said the mean was equal to, I don't know, 50. And the standard deviation is equal to ouch, six or something. Sure, I know. If I asked you, hey, what's the probability that X is less than 41? Okay. Well, you're like, well, wait, 50 is here in the middle. That's true. And then uh, 44, that's true. And then 38, that's true. So it's somewhere in the middle of those two. That's absolutely true. Here's the deal. We are not going to answer this problem directly. What we're going to do is we're going to create ourselves a z-score. We're going to get negative 1.5. What we're going to do is we're going to solve this problem. Here's zero. Here's negative one. Here is negative two, obviously. Here's negative 1.5. What I want to know is I want to find this area down here. So in other words, what we're saying, this is equivalent to the probability that Z is less than or equal to negative 1.5, okay? This is referred to as the standard normal distribution. That is, it's Z, we say, is distributed normal, zero, one. So we're going to standardize these suckers. Every single one of them, we're going to standardize. Every one. We're not going to screw around with it. We're not going to go, well, no, 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 no. Every one, we're just going to straight up standardize. It's a big deal because once you understand that concept, boom, we're off to the races. Now, uh, we will not be making you integrate this one by hand. We'll have, we'll have Betsy help us. If Betsy would start. There she comes. So what we're going to do, go into here. Into here, and then we're going to say equals norm dot s dot this. That's the standard normal. Okay. Oops. And so we said negative one point five, comma, and then always one. It's always one on the same on these normal distribution problems, because remember the normal distribution is is continuous. Okay. And so it's just a CDF always less than or equal to. That's what we're looking for. So I hit enter and I get 0 0.066. So what we're saying is these two answers, both of them are, oopsie daisy, same answer. There is a 6.7% chance. Oh, okay. My computer just went blank and she's back. Okay. That freaked me out a little bit. Uh, is 0 0.0. But she's not going to write. Okay, just a minute while I refresh that pig. There we go. It is 0 0.066. Nice. Okay. So our answer, again, for both of these is 0 0.066. There's a 6% chance that we're down here. 
Okay. And my computer did it again. You got to be kidding me. Point zero six six. Okay, there we go. Whew. Got it. Nice. That that's where we're going with that. Now, you like that wasn't very hard, and then we talked about it a little bit, so it shouldn't shock you terribly, but okay, just a minute. Just a minute here, real quick. I need to click here. Oh, excellent. Okay, nope. Okay, perfect. All right, just want to double check that. So let's come back to. Not sure why that's not showing now. Oh, here we go. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, ah, the hell happened? Uh, not sure what's going on. Okay, there it is. It's freaking me out. Can see what I'm doing. All right, now, um, again, that is for, now this is a big deal. This is the probability that you pick one X value by itself. One lone solitary X value. But what if I chose a sample? So again, what if my mean was equal to, and my computer is freaking out. I don't miss zooming, not even a little bit. Come on, give it to me. So suppose, suppose I told you, I don't know what that says, that the mean was equal to 50 again. Are you? Well, come on. I may have to reboot this dumb computer. Gotta be kidding me. Let's go do that real quick. That's embarrassing. All right. So if we think about that for a second, though, I'll come back over here and share this real quick. Okay. Suppose we take it, so we just did it for a single value. Nice. Okay, but let's suppose we did it for a sample of size 50. Okay. Now let's think about that for a minute. So we had um, we had that the mean was 50, I believe. I wasn't listening to myself. I think standard deviation was what? Six. Standard deviation is six. And um, yeah, so let's do a size of, uh, of 50. Yeah, because why not? So now my Z score, and I'll, my computer, we fired up here for a moment to get started on this. So let's ask this question here. What's the probability? The probability that X bar that is the sample average is less than 41. Okay. What's the probability of that happening? Okay. So your Z score then is going to be 41 minus 50. That part stays the same, it's still negative nine divided by, and now you're going to have uh, six divided by the square root of 50. Now, square root of 50 is, is seven, basically. So the denominator, so the denominator being six, now the denominator is 0.83. Well, think about that. It used to be six. Yeah. So before I was one and a half standard deviations away. Now my standard deviation, now my thing is going to be about 0.83. So instead of dividing by six, nine divided by six, I'm going to have negative nine divided by 0.83. Holy buckets, that's going to be like negative 13 or something. It is. Whoa, that's weird. Dude, it's beyond weird. It is beyond weird. Uh, it is it is freakish, actually. Now, fortunately, we don't see a lot of freakish things happening unless we cause them. Okay, that is, if if for some odd reason you work somewhere and you come up with some new thing. Um, by the way, if you're coming up with it, that means you're probably the boss. But boss is really kind of a good idea. So that probably wasn't true. So, anyway, but again, hypothetically, if you're trying to fix something, you have this great idea. You're like, I know, I will, uh, whatever it is, 
and implement some new strategy. Once you've implemented the strategy, and then you come back and you find out that, oh, geez, there's almost no chance that this happens if, if the, uh, well, if, if, if everything's the same as it used to be. And so what we'll then assume then is our program must have worked. I'm almost back on my pissing me off. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you the math on that one. So put the equal sign there. See how good my math was. I guess negative 13. Oh, it's negative 10.6. Poor guess, Jay. Now, if you come up here and you type it into this guy, where did I put it here? So equals uh, norm.s.ist of this guy. Now, wait a minute. Remember, negative three standard deviations. That, that's downtown Freakville. There is basically no chance that happens. When you're at negative 10, I mean, Judas Priest, sir, you are way out there. There is 0. 0.00000, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 25 zeros and then a one chance of this happening okay in other words it didn't happen it's not going to happen now when we start talking about these things tonight's class is going to be getting wrapping your head around kind of how and why we're doing this but when we move into start to getting what we call hypothesis testing that's where the rubber really needs to throw in this thing because again you will have developed a plan to fix something okay and so you change a variable Okay, and then you do a test like this, and what you found is, geez, z is now negative 10. Well, that would be weird, but it would only be weird if nothing had changed, but you changed the variable. So what does that tell me? What you changed, that one variable you changed, made a big impact. That's what it means. That's how all of our testing is going to work from now on, okay? Or the other way this works is the machine is supposed to be putting these things out. Month after month, day after day, hour after hour, it's churning out the same thing. Boom, 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 boom. You keep pulling stuff off to test every hour or whatever it is. You pull off a sample. You test. Hey, look at that. It's right on the money. It's right where it's supposed to be. And then all of a sudden, one time, you get a sample that has, it's like negative 10.6. You're like, what just happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. A variable has changed. Well, what variable? Well, in your case, I assume this machine is now out of calibration. And so in your case, shut that sucker down. Let's fix it. Okay. Those are the two places where you will see this stuff happening. Now, frequently what will happen in the quote unquote real world for most people is somebody has told you this is how we do it. You take a sample every hour or whatever. You do this. And if the average is above this or below this, shut it down. They don't tell you why. They don't tell you why to take a sample of 100. They don't tell you uh, why we shut it down. That's where those numbers come from. In fact, every term I have someone come up to tell me, that, hey, they do that at my job. They tell us to do this, but we don't know why. This is why we're building towards that, okay? I am back online, maybe. Cool, awesome, I think. Stay with the host. Computer audio. All right, we're back. Maybe, I hope. Okay, so. Let's uh, oops. Let's do this. Uh, let's do this. Yes, I want to share my screen. Cool. There, here we go. Nice. Okay, so that's where we're going with this business. That's that's the big, long and the short of the central limit theorem. Once again, regardless of how the original axes are distributed, doesn't matter. Don't care. Skewed. I don't care if they're symmetric. I don't care if they're actually normal. I don't care if they're discrete. They could be Poisson. They could be whatever. Doesn't matter. Their sample averages are distributed normally. That's a big deal. Because if that was not true, I couldn't make a Z-score and I couldn't use Excel to find that probability. That's a big piece of it. That's what, something we're kind of keen on here. Now, um, freaking computers. All right, computers. Okay, now you're gonna work. Maybe. Maybe. Nope. What is your freaking deal, bud? Uh -huh. Now we pissed it off. Now I did it. And we're done.
She's locked up tighter than a drum. Experiencing technical difficulties. And this one wants to restart. How fun. Okay, so we are. There you go. There you are. Okay, you're back. Okay, no. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get rid of the other one because it's locked up. Okay. So, so what I want to look at now is the ID, and I'm going to just I'm going to use this other program real quick to just sketch something real quick for us. Um, uh, GeoGebra. And I'm only using this just to demonstrate something while I'm waiting for another thing to pop up. I'd like to look at a graph real quick. Um, this is, it's kind of a neat program in terms of, of course, it'd be helpful if you click on the right thing. There we go. Nice. So this is helpful for me just for quickly teaching um, what some of this stuff looks like. This picture's kind of handy. Maybe it is if it will ever start. Okay. So I'm going to go to, oh, here it is. They moved it on me. You yeah, hippie. Nice. 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 Look at that. There's our normal distribution problem. Very nice. How exciting for us. Nice. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to do a couple of different ways. This right here is your PDF function. This shape right here is your PDF. And what it's giving me is giving me the probability that we are less than one deviation from the mean. Okay, and we do this a couple of different ways. Let me just click here real quick. Look at this, between negative one and one, there are 68% of the population, again, roughly. Between negative two, well, I'll just type it in, dummy. Negative two and positive two. There is roughly, wait for it, 95% of the population. That's exciting. And of course, from negative three to three. Ta-da, there it is. That's, it's everybody, okay? Now you're like, well, you're like, what if I change that? What if I get negative three or from negative, well, first of all, if I'm less than three, that leaves me with about 0 0.015 or thereabouts above from here up. Okay, that's cool. Um, if you put in negative three right there, you can see that basically nobody is less than that. Okay. If you put in negative two, you can see that there's only about 2.2% 2, 2, 2 of the population is below this. And if you want to do it the other way around, if you want to do this guy, you can see that oops, there's about 2.2% from, from here up. Okay. So we kind of do when we do these things, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So we are going to be finding these values. The value we're going to find using Excel will always be less than. That's how Excel has been set up for years. It's that way because it's an integral. It starts at negative infinity and it integrates over to where you tell it to stop. That's the, obviously the CDF action of it. Okay. That that part right there is pretty swell. Now, let me. I think Betsy may be ready to go. Maybe. All right, we're getting logged back in. So then the question might be something along these lines right here. Now, again, if you had, so I'm gonna put this at one right there. And so as you can see, again, that's 84% less than that. But watch this, if you were to come in here and go and make this like, I don't know, 80, and make this like, I don't know, 10. Oops, I said 10. I said 10, there we go, nice. And if I put in you know, like less than one, well, I'm never gonna be less than one, good Lord. That's like, uh, that's a lot of standard deviations that way. That's weird. But if I put in 90 here, well, look where I'm at. Where am I at 90? 90 is one standard deviation above the mean. And from here down, ta-da, it's still 84%. This is why we standardize everything, okay? Now again, had Excel been around back in the day, we would just probably learn how to just type it into Excel and be done with it. We would never learn the concept of standardization. But the nice thing about the reason that we do standardization 
is because back in the olden days, back when I was a kid, um, you would actually have just a table of values and you would just go look up. In fact, some of you may have learned statistics that way. Um, uh, this is how a lot of people still teach it this today. And even though, even today's, oops, shoot, no, cancel, stop. No, 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 go away. Well, that's probably no, I don't want it. Oh, let's try this again. I'm trying to do two things at once and I have a hard time doing one thing at once. Um, Today, here we go. Cool. Um, hey, we are, we're back on. Cool. Awesome. All right. Cool. So, what I'm going to show is this over here. Some of you still have taken classes over the years from people at other colleges, and maybe at our colleges too. Sometimes it just depends. And what you'll see is you will think that they are. I don't know what they think. But they will bring up these old tables from back in the day and they're like, oh, see, I'm being better because I'm making the kids do it the hard way. All this is, dude, is you look up your Z-score. That's all you do. You look it up on the side. So I have a point. I have 1.2 uh, or 1.0. Look at that. Like 1.0, that's 0.8413 from there down. What? Yeah, that's it. Different ones were set up differently. Like this one here, it measures from zero over to there. So obviously from here back is 50%. And so from here over, it tells you how much more there is. So like if we go over to one, there's 34% right there. And then if you add 50% to it, 84%. Woo. So that's how we used to do it. But again, it was set up from the standpoint of it was an integral problem and it was always going from negative infinity over. And again, standardization, because once you understand the concepts, I don't need to make it. I make a Z-score every time, but as soon as I make it a Z-score, I'm like, I know exactly where I am. Two standard deviations, hey, that's weird. Uh, one, you know, point two deviations, hey, that's and they're right on the money. We're in, we're good to go. So again, let's. Uh, you'll be seeing some problems like this tonight on the homework. For instance, it'll say something like, "Hey, there's the probability that um, x is greater than sixty if you have a mean of um, seventy and a standard deviation of sixteen. I don't know. I don't know, but I do know this, that we are not going to solve this one directly. We're going to do it with a z-score instead. So what we're going to do is we're going to go, hey, z is equal to 60 minus 70 over 16. That's not a calculator. So negative 10 16. Well, that's embarrassing. That's negative 5 8 dummy. So negative 0.625. I had to reach clear cost there and I know it off the top of my head. There we go. Okay. So here is here is negative 0.625. Again, here is 70. Here is 54. We are right in here somewhere. And we want this. First thing that occurs to me is that's over 50%. Okay. It's over 50% to go that way. That's the first thing that occurs to me. Second thing that occurs to me is when I type in this thing here in a second, it's going to give me the area that is less than that. So I got zero here. Here's negative one. Here's negative 0.625. We're going to find this area. But we have to be a little careful because the CDF always gives me less than or equal to. So equals norm dot s dot dist negative 0.625 comma one. And so I get about 26% roughly. Now, of course you need to do on your picture, this is 26%. Well, that's not what I want. Oops, that's not what I want. I want the upper part of that. So obviously it's a one minus that. So whenever you see a greater than problem, get in the habit of this Excel, just come in here and get in the habit of putting a one minus in front of that and do it all at one fell swoop. We'll be doing that a ton. And so, voila, it's 73%. That is the answer that we saw. It is 73%, okay, that's it. Again, this is for one um, 
observation. Nice. But what if we took a sample? Let's take a sample of 30. Cool. Then my P score. God bless it. What is your freaking problem? Just freaking start, bud. So I'm gonna take a sample, take a sample of n equals 30. So my z score becomes once again 60 minus 70 on top, but on the bottom it becomes 16 divided by the square root of 30. Okay, so the square root of 30 is like five-ish, five and a half, whatever you want to call it. It's not really important. But let's say it's five. 16 divided by five is three-ish. So instead of dividing by 16, so I notice I have negative 10 divided by 16 before. I'm going to have negative, I'm going to have divided by like five this time. Whoa, that's going to give me like negative two standard deviations. That's correct. What percent of the population is greater than negative two standard deviations? Pretty much all of it, bud, about 97%. So kind of keep that in your head as we're going along because that's really gonna speed the process up a little bit here. You, in other words, you're, as soon as you see it, you can't unsee that. It's so fast to be able to kind of go, oh, that's gonna be weird. Uh, let's try that again. So I got 2.9 and negative 10 divided by 2.9 is negative 3.4 deviations. Holy bucket, look where we are. Look where we are. We are now at negative two. There's negative three. Here's negative 3.4. What percent of the population is bigger than us? Well, basically all of it, yes. So let's go ask Betsy. Uh, oh, Betsy. Let's just go ahead and put this negative 3.4 business in there. percent. 0.996. Maybe there's three nines. I didn't pay attention. And most of them are greater than that. Okay. And again, why? Because of the central limit theorem, this dude gets a lot smaller, which blows this dude straight on up, making it weirder than had it not been done. That. All right. That is a big deal. Okay. Again, the exact same premise. Okay. Now, the only difference I would say is this. When you go up here on this guy, this was uh, we were under the impression on this problem that the original x's were also normally distributed. Okay, I had to do it that way. This part down here doesn't matter what they were originally, it makes no difference to me what kind of distribution it is. The way I did this problem up here, I assumed that they were normal. Okay, but I could have just as easily assumed they were binomial. Okay, so we could do a problem where we know. There's a certain, there's a certain, it's a binomial distribution. We could find out what's the probability that we're less than this because it's a binomial CDF. Okay, that's cool. That's great. But yet, when I take a sample, the sample then becomes normally distributed. And that's a big deal. So let's try one of those. Questions on this guy here before we move on? Again, there, there's really no difference in how we do it. It's the really that denominator part is the, I mean, obviously changes, obviously. But it's not a huge concept. It's just, you know, just knocking out and do it. It is a big deal in terms of what it, how it works. But in terms of how you do it, it's, it's an easy thing. I mean, it's, just, it's the same thing every time. But in terms of like what it means, that's the art, that's the overarching big deal. Um, yeah, so let's do this. Let's say we've got something that is binomial. Uh, and uh, let's do this. Let's do this, those defective resistor things again. Cool. So I take a sample. So no, I don't take a sample. I take a, I take, I just take one at random. One what? Remember the deal is here, I take a, a hundred resistors and I count how many defectives there are. When I do that, that is one thing. I've done it once, that's it, that's all, okay? What is the probability that X is less than seven, less than or equal to seven defectives. I don't know. 
but I can figure that out. Because this is a binomial distribution, I can just go to the binomial CDF, right? And the computer is going to ask me for a few things. So I'm going to say equals binomial dot disk. There we go. It wants to know the number of successes. I'm interested in seven. Thanks. How many times are you playing? I'm playing 100 times. Remember, when I sample 100, when I take 100 of those little buggers, that's one. That's one. I played the game one time. After I've said, let's, we're doing 100 trials. That's what I mean. Comma, 0 0.05, and then comma, one. There's an 87% chance that we see less than or equal to seven defectives out of 100. 87%. It's 87%. This is for one, one. But if I take a sample of 100, now I'll take a sample of, I'm going to do a different number than 100. Everyone gets freaked out. I said, sample of 50. There you go. Take a sample of 50. In other words, I'm going to take 100 resistors now, check them out. I write down there, I got five defectives. Cool. I do it again later, another 100. I got 10 defectives this time, and so on and so on. I do that 10 times. I do that 50 times, rather. That's my sample of size 50. Okay. Well, then now I'm going to make a Z score. I didn't make a Z score because that sucker is binomial. But the averages are going to be are going to be uh, normally distributed. So here's my question to you. Remember, the mean is five. I expected five. That's right. And I'm asking about X bar. I wonder the probability that X bar is less than or equal to seven. Let's find out. So it's going to be seven minus five. Okay. And then again, if you just got here a few minutes ago, if you got here a few minutes before you miss this part, I'm just going to tell you right now, it's N, P, Q is how we find the standard deviation for a binomial. I only mention that because it's kind of a big deal for what we're doing right now. Uh, you're, but you won't be doing it on the homework side or anything like that. It's just a, simply a matter of, so it's 100 times 0 0.05 times 0 0.95. I'm just doing it to sell things here a little bit. So divided by 2.17, okay, 2.18, I guess. Cool. So this is 2.18. That was the original divided by the square root of 50. Nice. So if I do that, I get 2 divided by... 2.18 divided by, oops, that's times, divided by the square root of 50. I get 6.48. Now, I almost don't even, well, I don't really need a calculator. If you asked me this, I'd say 100% of them. I would say 100% of them lie less than, there's zero, here's one deviation, here's two deviations, here's three. You're six and a half out here. What percent or less than this? Uh, all of them, basically, right? We'll look it up, but it's basically all of them. Why is it not 87 anymore? Because we went way further out in the tails that time. Way further out in the tails. Like, wow, out in the tails. Um, 6.48. Yeah, look at that. The computer just says, oh, screw it. It's one. Now, even Betsy knows it's not truly one, but she, yeah, screw you. It's one. Now, okay. Uh, yeah, there's no chance anybody's higher than that. Okay. And that's fine. Okay. So it's 100%. Look at where we went. We ended up going from, we, we weren't even in the tails. Like there is no tails on this problem. This, this, this problem right there is uh, that original binomial distribution. Let's take a look at what it looks like, by the way in that GeoGebra program helps to visualize what's going on. If I go in here, I can actually change this to binomial. No, I said I could, there it is. Aha, uh -huh. nice. And let's do N as 100. And P is 0 0.05. Nice. Down here we are. And then it continues down and it, there's, there's more coming this way. But it's a skewed distribution. Lots more at the start, and it peters off as it comes out this direction. Okay. And so we said actually less than or equal to seven. That's what we did on the computer a minute ago. Things is 87%. Okay, so we're here now. Okay. 
But when we standardize that sucker, it, again, we only can standardize in this case because we took a sample. Okay, we cannot do it for one for one. Um, you just take one thing out of this group; it doesn't work that way. I have to take a sample and deal with the sample average. There, okay. So the big key when you're doing your homework this week and you got to pay attention to it is: did they talk about one item or one individual, or did they talk about a sample? That's huge. I promise that's going to be on the test. Um, it's something I do every time to keep you paying attention and to make sure that it's crystal clear in your head. Are we talking about a single variable or are we talking about, or a single observation or are we talking about an average? Okay, remember averages are way less variable. That's why you will never take a sample of 50 people, let's say 50 men in America and look at their average heights. You will never, ever, I promise you ever get that the average of, let's say 100 dudes is six foot one. It'll never happen. If the average is 5'10", you will get things like five ten and a quarter. You'll get like five nine and a half. You'll get all nice and tightly packed around there. You will never get six one. Heck, I bet you'll never get exactly five nine or anything less than five nine. It's just not going to happen because our averages are not that variable. That's, that's what it's all about. Okay. Now, um, next week we're going to talk about hypothesis testing. So I'm not going to get into that tonight, but what I do want to focus on tonight um, is I want to focus on, well, okay, give me an example where I can use this. Oh, I'd love to. And, and so we're gonna have several different examples. This week, it's gonna be about um, confidence intervals. Next week, it's going to be about um, uh, hypothesis testing. And we're gonna spend a couple of weeks talking about hypothesis testing, and then we'll do a little bit of regression. Um, those are the three more topics that we're going to be chatting about. They all stem from what we're talking about tonight. They all stem from what we're talking about tonight. So when we play the game, they're like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Cool. Nice. Um, and, and then away we go. So the first thing I want to chat about is confidence. Intervals. Now, for the most part, for the most part, this is done when I have no idea what a parameter is. Oops, is. So I take a sample, compute a statistic. and create an interval, an interval, I'm gonna say that should capture the unknown parameter on, you know, on the number line. So perhaps my, perhaps, it's between five and 10. Suppose that maybe that's my confidence interval. I am confident, and we're talking about how, how what I mean by that, that the unknown value, let's say the unknown average is between five and 10. Okay, well, that's kind of a big deal. If the unknown average is between there and there, and I'm pretty confident of that, then I can make a decision moving forward. Let's say you, uh, I don't know, you're gonna get into the shoe buying, the shoe selling business. So you need to know like, you know, what the average, size is and then you know you, if once you figure that out in your community or whatever then you can work backwards from there and say okay well then if that's the average then i can then build out to see you know what kind of uh you know what kind of shoe selection or whatever i want to do and, and anything else like that as well anytime when you don't know something going in so these what i don't know could be averages could be frequently they are they could be percentages we just got done with elections, sort of. And so anytime you do a polling, um, you're gonna have confidence intervals with percentages. Okay, it's always gonna be true. It could be for standard deviations. Okay, those are the three biggies. Okay, um, those are the three big ones that we do all the time. And so here's the here's the sweet thing about it. We are gonna talk about 95% confidence intervals. In the hard sciences and uh, you know 
engineering and things like that, we talk about 95% confidence intervals. Okay. In the soft sciences, your sociologists, et cetera, they like to do 90% confidence intervals. That's because people are weird. I don't know if you figured that out or not yet. People don't behave appropriately. They don't behave. They don't behave necessarily like a piece of metal does, right? You get a piece of metal, metal, I mean, for all intents and purposes, steel is steel. Like, you know, it doesn't really matter where you source it from to a degree, obviously. But, you know, I do the same thing to this piece of steel, I do the same thing to the next piece of steel. I should get the exact same response, more or, I mean, for the most part. But with people, it's totally different. Oh, look, I gave this person some flowers. I hope that made this person stay. Oh, thank you so much. This person goes, oh, flowers, cool. And the person's like, oh my God, you're so great. And then you give it to me and you're like, I'm a little, I'm a little stuffed up now, thanks. Allergy season, et cetera. And somebody else goes, oh, they smell so pretty. Thank you, et cetera. And then some person goes, oh my God, why do you mean flowers, you jerk? And you're like, wait, what? Huh? But that's typical of people. People's responses are all over the map. So as a result, because they're so all over the map, typically they go to 90% confidence. In other words, you're never gonna get far enough in the tails to be 95 is basically what that boils down to, okay? Um, and that's just kind of how those things work always. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is this, we are gonna create a situation where we're gonna have 95% in the middle here. And you're like, ooh, we did this. It's two deviations. Well, yes and no. Turns out it's negative 1.96 and positive 1.96. So I say it's two deviations is about 95%. I wasn't totally lying. Technically, it's at 1.96 and negative 1.96. Okay. That means that between here and here, you will have 95% of the population. That's what we're talking about. But the way we're going to be looking at it is this. We're gonna be looking at this kind of a situation here. We're gonna go out and we're gonna take a sample, take a sample of size n, nice. And so what we're gonna do is we are going to make a z-score for it. And so it's gonna be x bar minus mu over sigma over square root of n. Now, I would say this, I probably wouldn't write necessarily all this down unless you absolutely want to. You're totally welcome to. Um, I'm going to get to the, the bottom line here in a minute. This guy, we don't know. So we're going to do some algebra to get there. Whatever thou doest to one side, thou must doest to the other sides too. King James version of the Cardinal Rule of Algebra. There you go. Now let's minus x bar to everybody. Nice. I don't want negative mu. You're an idiot talking about negative mu. So I multiply everybody by negative one, and my signs flip flop. Yes, meaning that this will now be the smallest side. And so I'm going to get positive x bar minus this fella is less than mu is less than or equal to x bar plus z sigma over square root of n. And that right there, friends, is a confidence interval. So what do you need to tell me? What do you need to tell me what x bar is? That came from the sample. Um, frequently, frequently, we don't have sigma either, so we use SX. This is the sample standard deviation, okay? And so what that boils down to is then we end up with really just this business right here instead. Okay. And then you're like, wait a minute. I feel like this seems very familiar. Of course it does. Check it out. X bar plus or minus Z SX over the square root of N. This part right here is referred to as the margin of error. 
So you say it's this and such with a margin of error of plus or minus blah, whatever it happens to be. This is for averages, for average. That is mu, right? The unknown average. The formula will be a skosh different when we talk about um, percentages in a few minutes. Well, a little bit, and it'll be it'll be different when we talk about uh, standard deviations. Okay, completely different. But again, based on the z, based on the z score. That's all it is. There's your central limit theorem. All I did was a little bit of algebra. Voila, there you go. So I don't know. Oh, for God's sake, my computer's going to restart if I'm not careful. Don't do that. Okay. Um, where'd you go? There you go. Um, so suppose you, suppose you want to know something about. Average weight of uh, one frogs. Sure. So I have no idea. So you sample 100 of them, 100 of them. And you find X bar is, I don't make this crap up. I have no idea how tall, how big they are. I don't care. Standard deviation is 0.3 pounds, sure. And I'd like a 95% confidence interval for, uh, yeah, that's what I'd like. So I'm just simply gonna go 2.2 plus or minus. Because it's 95%, it will always be 1.96. Point 0.3 over the square root of 100. Now, if you're like me, I prefer, oops, I prefer to find my um, margin of error first. I just find it easier. So 1.96, that's 86, dummy. 1.96 times 0 0.03, I believe, and you get 0 0.058. So that means that I am confident 2.205, come on, dumbass, 2.258. Boy, you have a hard time today, Jay. 21.42. Is that right? Nope. Try again, dummy. If you run a calculator, we have All right. 22.2.2 minus 0 0.058. 2.1. Nice. Now, what does that mean? We say that we are 95% confident. A true mean lives in here. That's how we say it. That's not technically correct, but I am not Mr. Pedantic, so I'm not going to harp on that. But I will say, I will say, that if I were to take samples of the same size, what this really means is this. If you keep taking samples of size 100, 95% of those will have an average. between 2.142 and 2.258, okay? 
So in other words, the idea is if I say you keep on taking, in other words, if you took an infinite number, you just keep taking them, take them all. 95% of them will fall between those two values. So even though this isn't technically true, this is how we phrase it. That's how it's used in the everyday parlance, okay? Again, I don't know what the average is, but I'm 95% confident we're in this ballpark, okay? Keep in mind, it's like throwing a dart at the wall. How confident are you that you hit the mark? Uh, hmm. But if I told you you throw the dart at the wall and then I would give you like a 10 inch circle around your dart, you're like, well, I'm feeling a lot more confident. Well, of course you are, of course you are. And so when we do these things, keep that in mind. You're like, well, why wouldn't I want to be 100% confident? Um, well, because that'd be weird, number one. But number two, be like this. Um, listen, uh, you're going to talk to me. You're going to, Mr. Grom, hey, Jay, I got this. I'm the greatest shot ever. Okay. With what? With a rifle. Well, right on. Uh, tell me about yourself. Literally, I can shoot this target 95% of the time. I can hit that stuff. Right on. Right on. Like, like what are we talking about? 200 yards? 300 yards? What are we, what are we shooting at? Literally. 10 yards away. Uh, so like the size of a lifesaver? No, I had this barn and literally it's like 100 feet by 100 feet. And I, I only miss it 5% of the time. Dude, you suck. <laughs> you are not good, sir. <laughs> now, again, let's say you get out to uh, a thousand yards. Woo, doggy. And you've got like a VW bug out there you're just shooting at a thousand yards away. Wow. That's good shooting, Dex, because that's a, because I don't care, a thousand yards, that's a, that's a good shot. Nice work. You hit that thing. How many times you hit it? Oh, about twice out of a hundred times. Well, <laughs> that's not too good. So we're, what we're shooting for is somewhere between, I, I, what we'd like is we'd like to have a small enough target that when you say you're going to hit it 95% of the time, it, like, yeah, that tells me something. But if the target is so ginormous, like the side of a barn, well, well anybody can hit 95% of the time, for heaven's sakes. I'm surprised you can't hit it 100% of the time. No, to get it 100% of the time, I have to like move inside the barn. When I shoot from inside the barn, I hit it 100% of the time. Oh, okay, good. Um, but yeah, ridiculous. Okay, so there's that, I, that, that concept there that, that I, what I'm looking for is I don't want such a wide target that I, I'm not, it's no use to me. I need it to be tight enough, but I also need to be confident enough, okay? Because I can make the, I can make the target so small that I will never hit it or very seldom hit like 20% confidence. That's not helpful at all either. What I want is I want a high confidence. And again, we use 95% almost all the time. So again, that's gonna be this 1.96. Um, and again, how do I make this smaller? Sample size, baby. The bigger the sample size, the smaller the spread of that baby. It's quite clear, okay? And again, where does this come from? It comes from the central limit there. Wait, wait a minute, wait, whoa, whoa. How do we know that those, uh, wait, so you, uh, horn frogs. How do we know those horn frogs are normally distributed weight-wise? Well, duh, they are, but let's say they weren't. They're like, but they're plus on. Well, so what? Doesn't matter because guess what we did? We took a sample of size 100. That's what we did. And so the sample of size 100 is going to be normally distributed. That is how we can jump from here on down to here. Okay, that's how that's going to work every single time. Okay. Uh, if you are ever in a class and they want to do a 90% confidence interval, 1.645 is the Z score that you should use for that guy. Okay. Um, there's a very easy why that is. And so I'm just going to throw that up here real quick. We already drew our 95% here and here. Okay, that means there's 0 0.025 down here. So on the computer, what we're going to do is come in here and go equals, give it to me. Come on, Betsy. Equals norm dot s dot inverse. What this means is you tell me a percentage. I'll give you a z-score. So I'm going to put in 0 0.025. And it's going to spit out a z-score of negative 1.96. Now, if I flip that around, and let's say I put in uh, 0.975, 
I'm going to be a positive 1.96 because again, the only difference is from here down 0.975. Okay. Um, because remember, Betsy's always going to give you area to the left or area less than. Okay. Uh, notice that it's really hard to get lost in a normal distribution curve. I mean, it's really hard to get lost. If you're down here, you're looking for negative z scores. If you're up here, you want a positive. If you screw it up, the answer is going to be like, oh, well, duh, I want the positive one. Or, oh, duh, I want the negative one. Okay, there's not a whole lot of thought process there. Um, you know, it's like, well, let's say you're at the store and like, oh, I'm going to spend this much, I'm going to spend 40 bucks and like I have a hundred dollar bill in my pocket uh, and I can't do subtraction. So I get my calculator and I go 40 minus 100. Oh, that's negative. Oh, you idiot. I mean, positive 60. Okay, it's that easy in Excel. Okay, you really can't get lost. If you're, if you're thinking on the one side, it spits out a negative, you're like, oh, crap, I want the other. Just make it positive and you're home free. It's so nice. Okay. Uh, let's do another one of these pigs here. Uh, so let's go, let's go sample. Oh, I, what do I want to know? I want to know something about the. To know something about not the actual because I can't find it something about the average or I would like an I good I would like a good approximation for the average um, weight of a poodle I'm not sure why don't really care cool so I'm gonna sample 60 of them and we find that the average from the sample is um, of those buggers weigh 30 pounds, sure. Standard deviation of um, 5.2 pounds, beautiful. And let's do a 95% confidence error. So it's going to be 30 plus or minus 1.96, 5.2 square roots of 60, beautiful. Clear, clear, clear. So 1.96, 1.96 times 5.2 divided by 60, so, so that's 31.3, 28.7, I guess, right? All right. Again, there's your 95% call. Okay. Now, think about this for a minute. What if, what if, what if, uh, I was gonna say, what if you're making poodles? Yes, you're God, you're on the poodle processing line and here they come off the shelf. It doesn't make sense, but let's just say, this is a situation where you're watching a, sometimes when things come out of my mouth, I'm just like, the heck are you talking about, stupid? But here you are, you're at the processing plant. Here they coming off the line. There they come. Wee, wee, wee. And you're charged with taking a sample of 60 of these little buggers every couple hours and seeing if in fact the machine's working. What if, what if, what if the poodles are supposed to weigh 31 pounds and you get this. Okay, they were supposed to be, they're supposed to weigh 31 pounds. This is the confidence interval that you got based on your sample. Is everything good with the world? It is because where does 31 fall? falls right in the middle, okay? That's what it's supposed to be, and it falls in that interval. But what if these little buggers are supposed to weigh 33 pounds? Uh-oh, 33 pounds is, uh-oh, that's out here. Well, that's weird. It is weird. So what's gone wrong? Well, the poodle factory is messed up, and we're making too small a poodle. We're not stuffing them enough or whatever. That's what it is. This is the poodle stuffing factory. We're not stuffing the little devils full enough of, of down feathers and so forth. Should take a lot, I suppose. We're not stuffing them full enough is the point. And so you should probably fix your machine, okay? So we will actually, we can actually use this 
for testing purposes later on. Because if we know what something's supposed to be, this is what we this is what mu is supposed to be. And if it were to fall outside of my confidence interval, well, listen, I'm 95% true. I'm 95% certain that the mean that's coming off the line is between 28.7 and 31.3. <sighs> that's nowhere near what it's supposed to be, which is 33. That seems unlikely. That, that it's still 33 and I took this random sample and I got this, this value. So one of two things is true. Either I got a very rare scenario to happen or something has changed. And in this case, we would say, hey, something has changed. They're not stuffing these little devils as full as they're supposed to be stuffed. And, and then you go again and fix the machine. That's it. Question on that though. No? Speak up if you need it. I'll take my time. Confidence intervals, very easy to do and very, 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 very useful tools. Okay. Again, could be from the situation as you don't know something. So you go out and found it. Awesome. Can also be used when we're talking about quality control or in a situation where you're sampling to see if something has changed. It's supposed to be this. This hour I got this. Well, that's just weird because again, the true mean is supposed to be here. Now, yeah, what it, not what it's supposed to be, but the true mean, the machine that with the average of what the machine is actually producing currently is between here and here 95% of the time. That does not include what it's supposed to be. So something must have changed. Okay, that's a big deal. Now, another one we'll look at is this guy. And I'm not going to run through the whole, um, I'm not going to run through the whole derivation of this one. Um, Oops, sorry, my bad. P minus, oh, okay, hang on. P bar, yeah, yeah, it's out of my P bar minus P, uh, wait, what's happening? What am I doing? Just a minute, let me try that again. Z, that's the problem, you dummy. It's P hat, there you go, plus or minus Z. We'll, I get there, I swear I'll get there. Don't worry about me. P hat, Q hat over N. Whew. Nice. This is what it is for percentages. Or if you prefer percentages, probability, proportions. Okay, it's all the same. Okay. Hey, P, P, that looks a lot like uh, looks a lot like binomial. That's right. This is actually based on a binomial distribution. Okay, that's where this comes from. Now, what is P hat? This is the sample probability of success. Okay. And then a Q hat, of course, is obviously one minus B. It's the probability of failure. Yes, from the sample, though. What we're doing is we're saying that P, the unknown probability of success, again, that is from the uh, binomial distribution is given by this thing. Oops, on the top end and on the bottom end, it's P hat minus Z square root of P hat Q hat over N. Nice. So let's say you'd like to know the percentage of people who ice cream good for you so you sample 200 people you ask them a good question not like my boss's question here's four answers stick yourself into one of these categories but i'm not in those categories stick yourself in there anyways uh, 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 okay so what are you going to do with those data that you got? Then we're going to make decisions and spend money and waste time discussing these things based on this stupid data set. Nice. So uh, again, uh, I don't know how you're going to phrase the question, hey, what's your favorite ice cream? Or do you love strawberry ice cream? Oh my gosh, I totally love strawberry ice cream. Uh, no, I don't like it. I, I kind of like it. It's okay. 
all those fit in there. No, I don't love it. Okay. So look at this. Uh, 37 people said, I love strawberry ice cream. That's exciting. So what is P hat? P hat is simply 37 over 200. That's 18 and a half percent, which of course we're going to use as 0.185. That is my P hat. Plus or minus, it's the exact same Z score. If I want a 95% confluence. And then P hat is 0.185. 0.815, it's Q hat, I suppose. And then 200 is my N. Uh, let's see here, turn the calculator on. So we're gonna do 0 0.185, no, nope. 0.185 times 0.815. Divided by 200, square root is 0 0.027 times 1.96, 0 0.058. So a lot of times we will hear this, there's an 18.5% of the population loves strawberry ice cream. with margin of error plus or minus five point eight percent. Okay. The margin of error plus or minus five point eight percent. Now if you're playing along at home, this gives us about an eleven, almost a twelve percent spread if you think about it, right? So if you add, I'm just going to call that six, you're basically going to get 24 and a half percent on the top end. If you subtract six, or I'm sorry, not there's a P in there. If you subtract six, you're going to get roughly 12 and a half percent on the bottom end. This is a huge spread. It's huge. Okay. And so what we typically do is we will typically pick an N, we'll pick a bigger N so that what happens is this gets smaller. So you'll hear frequently, you're, if you're paying attention, it's almost always plus or minus two or plus or minus three percentage points, okay? You hear that all the time to the point where it's ridiculous, plus or minus three percentage points, plus or minus three percentage points. Once in a while, plus or minus two, but usually plus or minus three percentage points. To get to two, you're gonna take such a giant N that you're gonna have trouble, okay? It's just not gonna happen, okay? Uh, but to get to three, you can do it. Of course, we need to be quite a bit bigger than 200 to get here, okay? And so that's the idea. You use a bigger one, you can drive this down so that it's a smaller, that is plus or minus three percentage points. That is, you get, in essence, a six, um, six percent wide spread across there. It's a smaller target to be 95% confident about. Again, and you got that because you took a bigger N. The bigger the N, the less variable our data is. Okay, it's just not, it's gonna be less variable the bigger the samples are. Pretty straightforward, I think, for the most part. Now, but that brings up a point. The, and the point is this, a lot of people will ask it because they start thinking about, well, how big do I need? How big of a sample do I need? It's an excellent question. Well, it turns out it's all based on margin of error, right? That's the whole point. So the margin of error is Z um, square root of P hat Q hat over N. And then you're saying that you want this to be less than or equal to some value, basically. Okay, I want this to be less than or equal to some particular value, whatever that value happens to be. Let's say three percentage points, let's say whatever it is, okay? Now, if you're just starting and you have no idea, like I have no idea, Jay, um, 
what percent of the population loves strawberry ice cream? Okay, so, well, what am I gonna use for P hat and Q hat? Dude, that's a good question. So if you have no idea what P hat and Q hat are, then use 0.5 and 0.5. Think about why that would be, okay? Uh, in a minute, I'm gonna solve for N here. And in a minute, when I solve for N, I'm gonna end up with a certain formula. And when I see that formula, what's gonna end up, need, what's gonna need to end up happening is it's going to be the, I, I, I'm the least sure going, I have no idea what P and Q are. So I'm pretty unsure of myself. But what it turns out then is I make P and Q both 0.5 and 0.5. What that does for me, is it makes my my interval a little wider initially, okay? And then after I get some data, then I can hone in on it, get a little closer, and I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. So to solve this, uh, obviously square both sides. Uh, P hat, Q hat over N. And then play musical chairs. So I'm going to play musical chairs with N on this side. I get P hat, Q hat, O, and then it's going to be Z over E squared. Ta da! You need to take an N that's at least this big. Okay, so if I didn't know anything about this strawberry ice cream deal, but I said I want to be within. Plus, uh, plus or minus 0.03, then I'm just going to do 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 1.96 over 0 0.03 squared. And so this is how many people I would need to ask, hey, uh, do you love strawberry ice cream? Come on, move. So 1.96 divided by 0 0.03 is that. Squared is that. Judas Priest, try again, Jay. What did you do? 1.96 divided by 0 0.03. That's more better. Squared is 4,200 and something times 0.25. So you need to sample at least 1067.11, which means obviously you need to really do greater than or equal to. 1,068 people. Yay. You rounded down to 1,067. You would be like 3 point whatever percent off in either direction. Okay. This again is you have no idea what happened. You have no idea how many like strawberry. Okay. So you go out, you sample 1,068 people. Well, isn't that exciting? And it turns out that from your sample, you found that today when you took the sample, you found that P hat was 18 and a half percent. Well, that changes everything because how big an N do I need to check tomorrow? Well, then for tomorrow, it's gonna to be P hat, Q hat, Z over E squared. Again, that first part stays the same. Move, come on. So that first part is the exact same, 1.96 divided by 0 0.03, oh shoot, squared. Nice times 0.185 times 0.815. Now I want to sample 644 people because I had some information going in. Makes sense. I know what it is. Now you're like, why do I? How? Where would that come up? Literally every poll about politics ever. What do you think about so and so today? Okay, so today I got some answers. 37% of people hate this guy today. Sweet, awesome. Uh, I'm gonna do it tomorrow because I think there's gonna be such a difference. Guess who I'm, I'm gonna use today's P hat, which was 37%. And I'm gonna, I can base on people I need to ask based on that tomorrow. Okay, because I already have that data from today. And then for the next day, I have today's data and so on and so on and so on. We do this all the time in that regard. I say we statisticians do this kind of thing all the time. But if you have no idea going into a problem, you treat it as it's a 50-50 situation. 
And because again, it's 0.5 times 0.5 is a quarter. That's 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 the biggest of two numbers you'll ever multiply together to add up to one. The biggest the biggest product I've ever had was 0.25. If I'm doing 0.1 times 0.9, I'm going to get 0.09. That's quite a bit smaller than 0.025, which is what I would get in this case. Okay. What this does for me is it guarantees me a big enough sample size that I will, even in worst case scenario, that I'll be within three percentage points. Okay. But again, it's that idea that if I tell people, listen, there's a margin of error of plus or minus 10 percentage points, dude, that's a 20% spread. Are you, are, are you kidding me right now? Come on, dude. You need to sample big enough to drive that margin of error down to where it actually makes sense. 3%, plus or minus 3%, that makes sense. Plus or minus 2%, hey, that makes sense. Plus or minus 10 percentage points, well, dude, that's, that's a big spread. Like, could you be less specific if you try? I don't, I don't know, maybe you could. Uh, so that's the idea there. Now, you're like, can that be done with our, our, uh, our one for Z as well? And the answer is yes. I'm not for Z, I mean for X bar, yes. So we can also do it for this guy because it is Sx over the square root of n, right? This piece here is our margin of error. So the margin of error is equal to this guy. Okay. And so if I told you, if I told you a margin of error, be less than four, less than or equal to four, whatever you want to do, less than or equal. I guess we'll do less than or equal to four. And it's a 95% confidence interval. And SX is uh, uh, nine. Sure, why not? Uh, how large uh, a sample? I don't know. Let's find out. So I got to solve for n. So when you solve for n, you're going to get e over z is equal to this. So if you flip both sides over, you get the same thing, obviously. And if you multiply both sides by sx, you get z sx over e is equal to the square root of n. So you just get z sx over e squared, which sometimes the book will write like this, just FYI. And sometimes Jay will write like that because he feels like it too. And then we say n is at least that big. Okay, and why is that? Because up here, the formula was going the other direction. When I flipped them over, sign flip flop that's when the sign flip flop sorry i didn't get that in there so in our case we said well we want a 1.96 for our z score and our standard deviation was nine and our margin of error was what did i say four let's make our margin of error a little smaller just for fun shall we let's make our margin of error Oh, let's make it one. Yeah. Over one squared. And so this is basically 18. Times nine divided by one is just that. And then square root. So 311. You would need to talk to 311 point whatever people. So obviously 312 people you'd have to talk to or interview or whatever it is you're doing, your measure or whatever it is to be within one for a margin of error. Okay. Now, obviously I could change that up a little bit. If I, if I notice if I use a four here, this becomes a two, two times two is four, four squared is like 16. It's kind of a boring problem. Hey, go ask at least 16 people, that's dumb. So I wanted to make it so there's a bigger number there in that regard, okay? Uh, yeah, that's great. Now, there's one last thing 
because as you're doing this, you're like, geez, well, can I just ask more people? Well, you can always ask more. You can always sample more to a point. And at some point, you're just chasing your tail. You're not getting any better information. You're wasting time and money. There's got to be a better way. Then there's other times you're like, like say, let's say you work for Toyota and you work in a crash test department. And you're like, geez, uh, we kind of messed up some of these Camrys we were testing. Can we get a few more Camrys to crash test? And like, just take all you want. We'll make more. Uh, kind of Dorito style. Just take as many as you want. We got this. Okay. So really, there's no limit to the amount of cars I'll let you crash if I'm Toyota. Because we make a zillion of them. It's fine. But let's say you go work for Rolls Royce. Yeah, we'd like to crash a lot more uh, cars. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, I'd like a lot more money too. Drop dead pal. You can't crash test more cars. It's freaking Rolls Royces. We only make 12 a year, okay? Uh, it's not gonna happen. Okay? Or picture this. You are studying, I don't know, Siberian tigers who live in, you know, Siberia and they're, you know, tigers. And you being a good veterinarian guy say, you know, listen, I feel like the reason that they're rare and they're, you know, endangered is because I, I feel like, I think the males just have a low sperm count. You know, there's only one way to test that, right? Um, yeah, Siberia is a big place. So there's gonna be a lot of money and time and expense here, number one. Number two, all right, I caught it. I'm sorry, you want me to do what now? Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of uh, money on the line, a lot of danger, a lot of whatever. Uh, I would like to sample a hundred of them. Uh, what part of their endangered do you not grasp, sir? Uh, would you be happy with 10? I would take 10, thanks. I'll be happy to get my 10 Siberian tiger sperm counts, okay? Um, ridiculous, okay? Obviously, I would love to have a, a sample size of 1,000 because then I can really hone in on it. But guess what? If I had 1,000 of those little devils, I guess they're not really that endangered, number one. And number two, Who's got time to track those suckers down? It's not like they're ants or something where you, you can trip over them every day every time you turn around. They're tigers and they live in the woods and they're all over the place. I mean, they're all over the place. There's a few of them and they're kind of dangerous. So I will take what I can get. So when we do these problems, you're like, oh, well, I'd like 312. Yeah, you'll take 10 and you'll be happy and you'll shut up about it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't be judgy. Yeah. So it turns out that if you have a smaller sample size for the averages, we need a new, I'm gonna call it a tool, but what it really is is a distribution. The Z distribution, the normal distribution is not gonna cut it. I need a different distribution. I need a distribution that functions very similarly to the normal distribution. That is, it needs to be symmetric. It needs to have like, you know, basically, if you will, like Z scores, like negative one and one and so forth. That's true. Obviously the total under here, obviously hundred percent, obviously. But it needs to function differently. Somehow I need a function that changes shape as n changes. And what I mean by that is this, I am less certain of my data if I only sample 10 people than if I sample 100 people. Why is that? Because again, the whole point of the central limit theorem what we talked about tonight was that the bigger N is, the less variable stuff is, the less variable our data is. Okay. But if I'm only sampling 10, it's gonna be more variable. That is, it could be over here, it could be more over here. What I'm gonna need is I'm gonna need a wider target, okay? Well, if you think about this, our, our, our uh, confidence interval equation was this guy. Right. Obviously, we're going to change n. We're getting a smaller n, but whatever. There's nothing that's going to change here. What's really going to change my width of my interval is this guy, but it's not going to be z anymore. It's going to be a different thing. I need to have something that's bigger. In other words, this z is just a multiplier. That's all it is. It is a, again, what is z? Z is a, z is just how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. 
And what is this? Well, this is the standard deviation. So it's two standard deviations, if you will, okay? But because we're less confident with a small n, we need a different tool and we need a tool that changes. And so that tool is actually referred to as a name. It's a distribution, it's called T distribution. Okay. And as N gets smaller, it gets wider. So what I mean is this, here it is with N equals, I don't know, 20. Right here in the middle is still zero. Maybe from here to here is 90%. I don't know. Maybe this is negative two and two, whatever. I don't know. I just made that up. Don't freak out about that. Just don't worry about it right now, okay? But what if N was equal to 10? Whoa. Well, that's right in the middle in case you're wondering. In other, in other words, in order to get 90%, I have to go out further out, still get 90% of the population because the smaller N is, the more spread out my data can be, the more variable it can be. So I have to go out further. That's the point of the T distribution. That's the point of it. Don't write those numbers down. That's not important what I'm doing right there. That's just a demonstration to show you that as N gets bigger, I'm less sure of myself because there's more variation. So I need to go out further to guarantee that I get 90 or 95 or whatever confidence I'm looking for, okay? Now, this distribution again, it's called the T-distribution. It's got a very interesting fact history back in the day. A guy who discovered it was working in a brewery and he was using it uh, to make beer better, obviously. That's what you do. But it turns out people back then when he was doing this, I forget what year it was, uh, they were, they were the beer making is an artisan thing. Uh, how dare you use science for God's sakes. And so he published under a pseudonym, it's called the student's T distribution or the student's distribution. Um, and so if you sometimes look it up, you'll see it referred to as that. That's where it comes from. It's not a big deal. How does it work? It works literally the same way. You come in here to Excel, and so if I want a 95% confidence interval, if I want 95%, again, zero is always in the middle. If I want 95% here, that's gonna give me two and a half percent down here. That's true, but we need to tell the computer something, okay? We basically need to tell it what N is, okay? We need to tell it that. So we're gonna say, I'm just gonna make one up. I'm just gonna say, let's let N equal 10 this time just for fun. Okay, now I come in here, it's equals T dot inverse probability. So 0 0.025 comma, wait, what the hell is this? What, what's this degrees of freedom business, Jay? Okay, so that is something that we will see a lot of in statistics. And for the degrees of freedom for a T, it's always N minus one. So in our case, it's nine. Don't ask me where they come up with that. I mean, I kind of know, but it's just long story. It's just N minus one right now. Um, it has to do with how the specific thing is that you're dealing with is based on. So it, what we're talking about here, we're using the standard deviation. To use the standard deviation, you actually had to use the mean. And so as a result, there's your, your one, there's quote unquote, one less degree of freedom than you had before. So that's just the game of it. Um, but it's neither here nor there. I won't hold you responsible for that. So negative 2.26. What that means is that instead of multiplying by 1.95, our formula is exactly the same. It was X bar plus or minus, but now it's a T SX over the square root of N. Everything is the same. So it's going to be what I say. Oh, did I do one yet? I didn't even do one yet. So let's take a sample, obviously a sample of size 10, obviously, because that's what I did. And I found that X bar was equal to 30 and SX is equal to three. And uh, yeah, let's have some fun. So this is going to be 30 
plus or minus, and instead of being 1.96, it's 2.26. What is that going to do to my interval? Well, instead of multiplying by 1.96, I multiply by two and a quarter. It's going to be a considerably wider interval than it was before. Why is it be wider? Because I'm less sure because I took a smaller sample size. Okay. So in order to be the same amount, sure, I have to go quite a bit wider out. Not sure what that's about. Uh, three over the square root of 10. You have email. Uh, three divided by 10 square root times 2.26, 2.14. So 30 plus or minus 2.14. That would be my 95% confidence interval. Again, that's a wider interval than if I had, had taken a bigger sample and was able to use a Z. Okay. Now, the traditional thought is this, if N is bigger than or equal to 30, this is what we refer to as a big sample. And so you will use a Z distribution. N is less than 30, T distribution. Okay. That's what it's all about. Once in a while, and our book does actually reference this in one place. Once in a while, they will talk about, hey, listen, if, uh, if, if you know the original data is, cement, is uh, normally distributed and you know what sigma is, then you can use the uh, Z distribution with N less than 30. Well, I got news for you. If, if uh, rainbow farts and uh, I don't know, whatever would power my car, I'd drive on it too, okay? It doesn't work that way, okay? You never know what sigma is. I mean, in, in the real world, that's never a known thing. So as a result, you're always using SX. So it really always comes down to, is N bigger than or equal to 30? Then that's a big sample and you can use the z distribution if it's less than 30 you can use the t distribution technically what that's saying to us is this is right around 30 is where they become in essence the same value okay and if you want to get particular with it we say that the t is asymptotically this uh as, is the limit is at, as the asymptotes or is asymptotically equivalent to the t the z distribution they're approaching the same value over time uh, let's pull this up real quick. The student's T distribution. There you go. Nice. So if the degrees of freedom. Parameter, oh, degrees of freedom. Yeah, here we go. Degrees of freedom. I'll put in 30. And as you can see, look at that right there. At 30, it's 0.837. It should be 0.84 if it was a Z distribution. So right around 30 is when they start becoming almost identical. If you get a very tiny one, you're like that one. You see we're down to 82%. Okay, so you have to go further out to get the same 84%. Okay, so instead of being at one, it might be 1.3 or something. Oops, that's too far. Whatever. So the idea is you have to go further out to get the same value because our data is more spread out. Uh, it's kind of cool to be able to do this sometimes, but the problem is on this thing, this thing auto ranges, and so you can't really see how stretched out the thing gets. Um, I have this one scan tool that does the same thing. It, it auto ranges as this graphing, and so it'll drop just precipitous and you're like, Lord have mercy, what happened? Well, it went from, you know, five to four, but it stretches it across the whole thing. And so it looks like there's this ginormous drop off the planet, but it really didn't drop at all. It kind of freaks a person out sometimes. So it's kind of hard to see. Um, uh, it's kind of nice. I used to have this other program I could do it where you could graph a bunch on top of each other. And you could see that the one with like five degrees of freedom was quite a bit wider than the one for like, 29 degrees of freedom. You can see it move, but it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Okay. But again, right around uh, N equals 30, which it gives us a, a degrees of freedom of 29, it's right in that ballpark where they're basically the same. And so that's why we say N bigger than or equal to 30, you just use a Z. And less than 30, you use the T distribution. Okay. Because uh, from then on out, there's really little difference between the two. They're, um, they're basically the same. So this week on the on the homework stuff, there's some book problems answering some questions using the central limit theorem with the normal distribution as well there. And then there's the confidence interval worksheet. 
Um, and I'm going to show that real quick. So those are the two things you'll be working on this week for the homeworks. What happened? No, no. Where's my thing? No. Canvas. Where did you go? Canvas. Aha, there you are. Got it. Let me pull this up for you right here. My, I'm a little off on my, where did it go? Where did my con confidence intervals? There it is. This is in the wrong week. I'm going to move it up to here. That's where it belongs. Anyway, confidence intervals. I'll pull this up real quick so we can see it. Nice, nice, there you go, cool. So there are 34 days, pay attention to that. 18 linebackers, what? Uh, 40 chocolate shakes, awesome, 30, nice. What you'll notice is on some of these, uh, on these ones here, they all want the confidence interval. And for some reason, some jerk gave you 90%. So pay attention to the 90%. So I'm gonna, I'll draw that up in a second just to make sure you're all on the same page with me here. Uh, on the 90% ones or any of them, like you could literally do a 60% confidence interval. You should probably be slapped silly for suggesting to do if you want to be 60% confident, but whatever. I mean, I'm not judging very hard, um, but if you want to do a 90% confidence interval, we're talking 90% in the middle, that's 5% down here, okay? So I'm just going to do inverse, or I'm sorry, norm, dot s dot inverse 0 0.05 and I will get 1.645 ish negative depends on who taught you my professor went with 645 some books will say 1.65 some will say 1.64 on the homework and on the test I will take whatever you did and call it good that's okay with that yes okie dokie but again it's the exact same problem you want to do 60 percent Guy could do that. That's kind of weird, but you know, knock yourself out. That'd be 20% down here. Okay. So norm S inverse of 20%. Again, it's just odd. Um, equals oops, equals no, dot S dot inverse 0.2. So negative 0.84. So you just be here, negative 0.84 standard deviations and positive 0.84 standard deviations, okay? And that would be your 60% confidence. Um, the idea here is you'd be obviously pinching it really tight in the middle. And then if you're pinching it really tight in the middle, then obviously you made your target really small. So you could be shooting outside of that and you could miss into the outside of it. Um, one thing more that we'll talk about a little bit more next week is that concept of, and you could do it with this too. It's, it's the same idea of using these. It's the same basic procedure, which can turn inside out. As if you wanted to build something, uh, well, I guess I should do this one. You take a sample, let's say you're a builder and you want to start building homes or whatever, and you want to shoot for the middle 65, 70% of the market. You don't want to build the giant mansions you don't want to work for those people necessarily. And of course, poor people don't hire, <laughs> don't hire a lot of contractors, dude. Well, I'm so poor. I live in a cheap house and uh, I can't afford you. So that's not optimal. So we're probably going to shoot for that middle range. Uh, can you buy, build me a $40,000 house? No, no, I can't. But I like to shoot for that middle range to keep myself occupied. So like if you wanted to shoot for the middle, 60% of the population, that's, an, that's a situation where it's, it is, in essence, a confidence interval. Are you with me? It's the same basic thing. So you would do X bar plus or minus, and then you would do this when we say 84, I think. 84 times your SX over the square root of N. And this would be, this is an example. This is one place where that might show up where you want the middle 60% or the middle 50% or whatever it is. Um, because you're shooting or something. That's, it's the same principle. It's just like taking it and kind of turning it on its head because it's, same, it's just the same thing. It's just kind of coming out from a different standpoint. Uh, again, we'll be using confidence intervals for two reasons. I don't know something that I need to know something about it. 
uh, something that's completely unknown. Again, people like chocolate ice cream, whatever it happens to be. Or I'll be using it because I'm taking samples off of my production line and I know what it's supposed to be. I take a sample. I get this confidence level from here to here. If my what it's supposed to be is in this interval, hot dang, everything's hunky dory. If it's not in this interval, okay, Houston, we've got a problem. Shut it down. Those are the things that we'll be using confidence intervals for. Now, next week, and then I'm going to shut up for a second. Next week, it's going to, we're going to get in, start getting into what's called hypothesis testing. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And um, once you understand the, the very first things that we talk about next week with hypothesis testing, the rest of them are all the same. Okay. Oh, it's a slightly different distribution. Yay. It's the exact same process. Okay. It's this thought process. And once you see that, you just, you can't unsee it. So that's, I think that's all I got for you. I am not going to Vegas now. So I will be in class on the 30th. So just FYI, I got out of that. So it's just never been one of my places I really wanted to go. And I managed to weasel out of it. So I'm happy about that. Anyway, questions, comments, concerns? Tests are graded, your scores are posted. It was on a curve, I added five percentage points. Somebody, I forget who it was, got 103%, I think. So they would have kind of messed up the curve, so don't hate them, but good job. Uh, so I just tacked 5% on, normally it's, some, normally it's a movie like at a 95, I'd bump up to 100 and call it good or something like that. That's what I ended up doing. Uh, but I'll have them next week for you. Anyway, questions, comments, anybody? Nice. Have a nice evening. See you next week. No question of it. Air quality control has been very helpful. Wait one. Oh, nice. Nice. Good deal. Yeah, I'm glad, Brian. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Uh, good times. Yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. Started working for Warren. And, uh, I love it. What, what company is that? Uh, Warren Automotive. Oh, nice. Yeah, no, they they were actually telling me today, like, oh, all these confidence intervals and standard deviation. I was like, I don't know this. And then today, they answered my question. Nice. Yeah, I love this class. Thank you, Jay. Have a That's good night. Cool. Hey, take care. Bye bye.